We have our rules, we have our stability and growth pact, uh, and we have to implement it. Uh, within the pact, uh, we have uh, our flexibility. This is not a concession towards this or that country. It is something that we have in our rules. And I will not comment on the uh, uh, Italian uh, draft budget, uh, because, by the way, we don't have it. Uh, we will have a draft uh, budget plan uh, in 12 days from now, uh, and I will give to this draft budget plan exactly the same uh, attention, attitude of dialogue, and seriousness about the rules that I will give to the other 26 member states. Uh, Honorable Ferber, I want to be very clear on this, crystal clear if possible. I am not, and I will not be uh, the representative of a single government in the Commission. We have representative in the Commission from the governments that I will be the Commissioner for Economic Affairs. And in this capacity, I will deal with all 27 draft budget plan when I'll be in office, if confirmed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Gentiloni. The treaty and the protocol on the Stability and Growth Pact are relevant here. They're a mere two pages or so. The Commission interpretation, handbook on the interpretation of the rules, encompasses more than 100 pages. Now, I'm not going to ask you whether between stages 1 and 17 it might be possible to save some money somewhere or to change the figures, but what I do want to say is that we need to simplify the arrangements here so that the member states know more clearly what the rules actually are, so that they're not scrambling around between the 17 steps and the 100 pages to try to find out whether they're complying with the rules. Compliance is important and therefore I think simplification is vital also. A tightening up of the rules in the Stability and Growth Pact. I think this is the only way it will be possible to implement it and also to impose a sanction if there is a breach of the rules. Thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with, the, with you on the fact that uh, the SGP uh, rules are uh, the contrary than a very uh, simple one. Uh, I appreciated the contribution uh, that the European Fiscal Board gave us. Uh, it was a contribution uh, concentrated on three elements, uh, more simple, more enforceable, and more anti-cyclical. I think that these three elements are interesting. We are uh, now, we have underway, as you know, the review of the six and two pact uh, rules, and we have to uh, finish this review before the end of the year, it will be a, a great opportunity to, to discuss the way forward. Uh, will we change legislatively or will we interpret uh, in a simpler way our rules? This week will be a big debate and I will give a contribution with you. Thank you. Uh, Jonas Fernandez from SMB. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Chairman, and welcome to you, Commissioner Designate. Europe, it seems now, is heading for an economic slowdown, and this slowdown is coming when monetary policy seems to have reached its limits. And as you said, it's clear now that we need another form of fiscal policy. But for that to happen, we also need to have a revision of the Stability and Growth Pact. Um, and at the moment, 
The idea or the objective is to control and check public accounts in each of the member states, and I think that's fine. But it's also true that the Growth Pact is also about bringing down deficit, but equally about making the most of fiscal space in other states which could contribute to improving economic activity across the board in the European Union. You said that the Stability and Growth Pact has better anti-cyclical capacity, but that also comes hand in hand with the Commission being strong enough to force certain member states to uh, complete investment and enhance the cycle. So how, what is your view of any revision of the SGP? Thank you. Uh, yes, we are, we are facing a slowdown, uh, as Honorable Fernandez said, and thank you for your question. Uh, we are facing a slowdown. Uh, we will have our economic forecast in beginning of November, in one month, more or less from now. Uh, and I think it will be interesting to, to understand the dimension of the slowdown. Uh, and the lasting of this slowdown to, to take decision on a fiscal uh, stance. Uh, but in general, uh, I agree with your point saying that our SGP is not only focused on uh, reducing debt, but only on growth and uh, on the fact that we have a coordinated uh, fiscal policy in Europe. Because it is true that having only the tool of monetary policy is not sufficient. Uh, in, the, in general, is not sufficient, but especially in these times facing such a slowdown, we need to uh, add to monetary policy a more coordinated fiscal policy with the differentiation that are obvious among different countries uh, and a strong uh, focus on investment. Uh, I think we have several tools in von der Leyen program of enhancing our job on investment. And I want to take the opportunity also to thank you as co-rapporteur and the other shadow rapporteurs uh, because of your decision that made possible Invest EU program, which is a relevant tool that we will use in the next five years. A follow-up. Sí, candidato. Yes, but the issue is that in addition to this reform of the SGP in order to achieve a global policy across the European Union which is more anti-cyclical, we also need instruments for the Eurozone which are centralised. And then they would complement fiscal policies at national level and give us an aggregate fiscal position at the Eurozone level. And Obviously, it's important to have the investment proposals that we heard from the previous Commission, and the President-elect has also come up with the idea of the Unemployment Benefit Reinsurance Scheme, but then a budget has also been proposed for the Eurozone. So what do you see as needing to be done to have uh, an aggregated instrument um, in addition to the member states and the national level efforts for the SGP? But what can we do then to better manage this anti-cyclical movement? Well, uh, we, we heard several uh, relevant uh, voices in recent weeks uh, stressing what I think is evident, that a, having a monetary union, we should need to have stabilization tools. Uh, this was repeated, I think, a few weeks ago here by President Draghi, it is frequently said by IMF, uh, OECD, but we also know that we have uh, to face political divisions among, among member states. Uh, the president-elect indicated uh, a few tools that are relevant from my point of view. One is this reinsurance unemployment scheme. 
the other one is the budget instrument for convergence and competitiveness. Uh, we have other proposals that Commission advanced last year, uh, and that I think we, we, we have not any necessity to put them out of the table. We have to continue this discussion, taking into account different position, but knowing that the future of a monetary union is the deepening of this monetary union, also with stabilization tools. Thank you. Luis Garicano from Renew Europe. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Gentiloni. What I'd like to continue along with this question with, on stabilization instruments and uh, the unemployment reinsurance scheme uh, proposed by Mrs. von der Leyen. I think this could be a very powerful stabilization mechanism. I think uh, these are counter cyclical policies that could s help to stabilize the Eurozone, but uh, as usual, the devil is in the detail. In particular, I would like to listen to some of your ideas on how we could establish this unemployment benefit reinsurance scheme in such a way that we avoid some of the risks that are in the minds of everyone, particularly my colleagues uh, in Renew Europe, i.e. to avoid uh, permanent transfers between member states uh, and how to ensure that it's in line with national uh, unemployment benefit schemes. We also want to avoid moral hazards. So how can this scheme be designed? Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Honorable Garciano. I think that this uh, proposal uh, has, in fact, a, a dual goal. Um, we have not to underestimate, obviously, uh, one goal, perhaps the first one, at least towards our citizens, which is the social goal of having an instrument to strengthen national instruments uh, against unemployment. Uh, and this is a, a relevant point because we, in this case, we can uh, join together a tool having a clear social message and a clear social intention and also a stabilization uh, consequence. Uh, but it is not only a stabilization tool. This is what I wanted to stress. Uh, what the... Uh, reinsurance scheme uh, should not be. You, you have already said it. Uh, it should not be a tool for a, a permanent transfer from country to country. It should not weaken uh, structural reform process uh, undergoing in single member states. It should be uh, concentrated on external relevant shocks and be uh, very quick, having automatic dispersion uh, mechanism. Uh, then we have uh, the big team, and I, I am tasked to define the mechanism, and this will be one of the main issues, technically and politically. Uh, will this scheme be concentrated on loans or on uh, direct uh, support to national budgets. And this discussion is very relevant. It is not sure that these two uh, scenarios should be uh, in complete contradiction, one to another. Uh, you can begin with one and then, but this is something we have to work on in the next weeks very quickly and effectively. Well, I look forward to working on this proposal with you, if you're confirmed. But uh, I'd like to hear what you think about the time frames. 
I'm a member of the Econ Committee. When do you think a proposal might come out? Is it going to be one of your major priorities? Is it going to be something that emerges a bit later on? And how do you intend to work with us on this reform? Uh, I will work immediately. Uh, the term immediately depends on the political evolution, but immediately I mean uh, if confirmed... On this, I will work on this with my uh, colleague uh, Schmidt uh, and uh, with, with, with the college. Um, to be uh, frank, it is clear that uh, having this uh, scheme um, based on uh, liquidity and loans is very easy. Uh, well, nothing is easy. It's easier uh, and more quick. Having it based on um, support to budgets is uh, more uh, complicated and has consequences also in the definition of our European uh, budget. But I said in my introductory remarks that we should be ambitious. And also on this subject, I think we have to be ambitious. Thank you. Sven Giegold from the Greens. Mr. Gentiloni, LuxLeaks and other tax scandals have damaged the fairness, efficiency and reputation of the European single market. The last Commission has contributed to important progress under the constant pressure of this Parliament. But the misuse of the common market for unequal and unfairly low taxation persists. Do you commit to present an action plan for fair and green taxation, including the following new legislative proposals? A. A new EU tax package on effective corporate taxation to contribute to a minimum corporate tax rate in the EU. And second, a shift towards environmental and energy taxation in the Union, including a kerosene tax for the aviation sector. And a carbon tax, including a border adjustment tax to ensure the respect of the polluter pays principle. Well, thank you, Honorable Giegel. Um, personally, I, I am convinced that uh, the taxation issue, uh, which uh, for, for decades was not so crucial, in, apparently, in the um, initiative of European institutions, because, because of the reason that you very well know, uh, has become more and more relevant in recent years. And this is uh, mostly uh, due also to the Parliament initiative. So um, my task, appreciating what has been done in recent years, that was something very relevant, my task uh, will be to try to keep uh, momentum on this issue and, if possible, to reinforce momentum. Uh, the proposal you are uh, making of a, a commitment on a, a new action plan uh, could be, from my point of view, a way to do this. So how to, to try to give immediately the message, yes, we are committed on these issues, environment, corporate, digital, tax fraud, etc. A good way would be to uh, propose to the college a uh, plan concentrating uh, the interest also of our citizens and public opinion on this subject. Then you know much better than me uh, that this is a uh, personal political commitment um, we are working in a college and we are working in an interinstitutional framework where uh, the decision on taxation are decision 
taken with the unanimity of the European Council. And this will, will be one of our main political challenge in the next few years. Follow up. Thank you for this uh, personal commitment. Uh, beyond that, uh, some of the proposals of the last Commission remain blocked in the Council. And in your written pro responses, you indicate to be willing to move some of these proposals away from unanimity towards uh, majority voting using Article 116 of the Treaty. Can you tell us already which of these proposals you are considering moving to majority voting and uh, when you are thinking it's the right moment to do so? Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, there are, as you know, uh, um, complicated uh, legal uh, uh, issues on the subject. Uh, if we refer to uh, Article 116, uh, as you know, we are referring to uh, relevant deviation uh, uh, on, on the condition of our single market. So, uh, in this case, if we are uh, thinking to use the art Article 116, uh, the choice of the subject is strictly linked to uh, this condition. So we can uh, move on some, for example, environmental issue or some uh, corporate tax issue towards the Article 116 only in the cases when there is clear consensus on the fact that this deviation, significant deviation, are there. For the pastoral close, I have finished my time, but maybe we will uh, be clearer with other questions, uh, but we are less uh, clearly uh, legally bind than 116, but we need unanimity on the other way. Thank you. Mr. Antonio Rinaldi from ID. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Commissioner Designate, I shall speak Italian. Mr. Gentiloni, do you think that we should rethink the Commission's method for calculating the output gap? The current system is such that, that it leads to a lower evaluation of potential GDP than alternative methods, for example those used by the IMF and the OECD. This therefore leads to greater negative balances. In Italy, on the 30th of September, so very recently, a budget was proposed proposing an improvement by 0 0.6 in the structural deficit. But in fact it will equate to a worsening of 0.1% and 0.4% therefore equates to unrealistic promises to recover taxes from r reducing evasion. Do you think that this budget actually indicates that the budget rules are not going to be respected? Page 9 indicates this clearly. Do you think that the excessive deficit procedure should therefore be implemented as was suggested earlier in the year? Then finally, do you intend to address the commercial surplus which, or the trade surplus which Germany and the Netherlands in particular have accumulated over a number of consecutive years. This has amounted to over 6% and this is in line with the six-pack provisions. Thank you. Grazie, onorevole Rinaldi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rinaldi. First of all, there is an update to the economic and financial assessment by the government, and this is required by Italian law. It's not actually a draft budget as yet. It is an update note. And therefore, with your permission, I would simply refer you to what I said responding to a previous question. I shall engage with this from the 1st of November 
if I am confirmed as Commissioner, and I will look in detail at the draft budgets from the 27 member states, including the Italian government, and I would anticipate getting the proposals by that time. The Italian government should be submitting its draft budget by the middle of October. As far as the output gap is concerned and potential growth... Many political parties, many observers have looked at and commented on this down the course of recent years. They have addressed inter alia the difficulty in identifying accuracy with the, of these indicators. The European Fiscal Board, for example, very recently analysed this and suggested that there should be more reliable criteria used, for example, benchmarking on public expenditure. They suggested that this would be more reliable rather than the output gap and potential growth, which were subject to rather more discretionary appraisal. Therefore, the discussion that we will be having in the course of, recent we of uh, coming weeks and indeed coming months will focus in part on looking at the revisions we may propose to the two-pack and the six-pack. My thinking is that we would probably be urging simplification so that the pack becomes simpler to manage. Uh, that is a very important objective. I've run out of uh, time to answer any further, so I'll have to leave it at that, I'm afraid. I know there are some countries which have more fiscal space it is appropriate for them to use that, but of course budgetary policy decisions are in the hands of national governments. But the decision of the, or the position of the Commission is that if you have a fiscal space, then it is wise to use it. Thank you. Okay. Grazie. Sarò velocissimo. Thank you. I'll be very quick. I simply want to address again the budget, the draft budget from the 30th of September from your government. This is obviously an important and significant document. It needs to go to the Parliament. It may be amended. We know that. But essentially, the guidelines are in place and the amendments will be marginal at best. I'd therefore like to hear your evaluation of your position on this. How will you interpret these numbers if you're confirmed as Commissioner? Because the previous government was treated in inverted commas in a different way. Then again to address the output gap, I was really only trying to ascertain from you whether you thought that the methodology was, it, the Commission's methodology was identical to the OECD and the IMF methodology so that we could have homogeneous data and comparability of data. For the rest, I'm simply interested, curious to know what sort of relationship you anticipate other countries having with uh, proposals focusing on fiscal, fiscal expansion. I would uh, hope that that would be the line that might be espoused. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rinaldi, for your follow-up question. On the question of fiscal expansion, I didn't have time to expand on that in my initial question, uh, my initial response. As far as the Commission's proposal is concerned, during the course of the summer, you will remember that we were looking at the idea of a broadly neutral fiscal stance. Now, on the 7th of November, we should get fresh forecasts, and these fresh forecasts, I think, will be indicative of a number of things. Inter alia, I think it will indicate whether there is a slowdown in growth. We're not talking in terms of recession. We're talking about a slowdown in growth. And we will get a clear indication of whether this is likely to be short term or might be somewhat more protracted. And that will then feed into the Commission's determination of a fiscal stance, which will be communicated to member states for the forthcoming trimester. Feld from ECR. Mr. Gentiloni, uh, good morning. I'm over here. Good morning. Uh, a lot has been said already about uh, stability and growth pact, fiscal rules, uh, fiscal matters. Now, uh, you're also uh, responsible, or you will be responsible if confirmed for Eurostat, where we still have that rule 
that public investment has to be uh, taken into the budget of the year of execution of the investment, which is, of course, economically a totally absurd rule. There's no private company that is not working with depreciation schedules for investment. Uh, I take the liberty to think that changing that rule would be by far the most efficient way to stimulate uh, investment and so to broaden fiscal space for countries. Will you change that rule? <clears throat> well, thank you for, for your question. Uh, the question allows me also to uh, state something um, I deem very relevant um, uh, because when I was uh, a designated commissioner uh, and I uh, knew by uh, the president um, that I, I would be also responsible for uh, Eurostat apart um, the two direction um, ECFIN and Taxwood that you know uh, very well for their uh, effectiveness and quality. Uh, the message I got, uh, and I'm really interested to repeat to you, is that the first thing that a commissioner should do, uh, having the responsibility of Eurostat, is to uh, keep Eurostat's independence. So about the criteria, uh, about the numbers, about the policies, I know uh, also from my experience as Prime Minister uh, that uh, politicians and members of governments are not always happy uh, of the content and of the timing of statistics, but this is the rule. Uh, so um, my, my first reaction to your uh, question is, in my capacity, being responsible for Eurostat will mean uh, having no influence in their autonomous criteria. Uh, it is up to the Parliament, to the College to discuss, but not to the Commissioner with the responsible responsibility towards Eurostat to decide if this criteria is or not correct. Any follow-up? Fiscal matters also have to do with taxes. I uh, hear you plead and uh, read in your uh, text that you are in favor of fiscal harmonization, and I understand also that you are in favor of qualified voting on taxation matters. Translated in daily uh, language, uh, that means for me that you will be uh, more in, uh, or should I say, running, if I may use that word, for the larger countries instead of the smaller countries. What will you do with the legitimate taxation interests of smaller countries? Uh, well, I, I will try to run for consensus, and this, I think, is uh, mandatory in, in, in a job of a European Commissioner, and it is especially mandatory on taxation, where we have, uh, apart the Article 116, we have the rule of unanimity. We all know that the last proposal on uh, significant digital presence um, presented by the Commission was uh, approved by, I, if I remember well, 24 member states and not by three member states, but this uh, killed for the moment and not for the future the proposal. So the uh, role of member states, big or small, on taxation is very relevant. But we have public opinion, we have the Parliament, we have the pastoral clause, we have Article 116. We cannot accept the idea to avoid any decision on taxation. Thank you. Uh, Manon Aubry from Goué. Bonjour. Good morning, Mr. Gentiloni. So I'm going to come back to tax 
evasion, which I think should be at the top of our agenda. I'm not going to run through the whole list of scandals and tax fraud and tax havens and the Panama Papers and LuxLeaks and, and so on. It's a long list, and it involves a number of multinational companies and certain companies, in fact, that you know well. If we look at your um, portfolio of uh, shares and assets, if you, for example, like... Uh, Amazon and others who are not necessarily held up as exemplars in terms of their taxation policy. And then there are very few companies, um, uh, well, there are some European companies that are on the list in terms of the Panama Papers scandal. But I, before I became an MEP, I worked for the NGO Oxfam that I'm sure you know, and along with other NGOs that you also uh, might have glimpsed outside the building, I organized an event this morning. And they're basically pointing to the fact that there are gaps in these lists of companies uh, with tax havens. And this was also pointed to in the Tax 3 Committee. There is an opacity that is prevalent in terms of the criteria um, used for companies and for other countries once they've taken off the list. So what are you going to do to make these lists more uh, objective without political interference? Are you going to reform the Code of Conduct group that created this opacity in the first place? And are you going to review the criteria for all um, damaging uh, or aggressive tax planning and what criteria will be used there? Bon, merci de votre question. Thank you very much, Honourable Member. Well, in terms of my portfolio, you did mention it. Well, that's all cleared now. I declared it all. It's all sold. All of the shares have been sold, and this happened before I uh, sent my documents into the jury committee. And I, I wasn't rich by any means, by the way. I heard in an Italian press that it was uh, the portfolio of a millionaire. But anyway, well, nevertheless, it's all been sold now. Now, I think you're right in the following sense. We do need to be efficient, more efficient if possible, in terms of uh, tax havens and transparency there. If you look at what's been done over the last years, you know, we haven't been able to be uh, uh, as efficient as we wanted. But I do think we've made some progress. I wasn't here, but I do nevertheless think even though I wasn't involved, that the Parliament should take the view that some progress has been made. You also have uh, the blacklist. You mentioned that. You know, there has been progress there. More needs to be done. But I think I can say to you, as a former Foreign Affairs Minister myself, in many countries around the world, the soft power of that blacklist at EU level is actually significant and it does work. It does change uh, mindsets, particularly amongst some of the worst uh, tax regimes around the world. So we've got to do more and we've got to do it together. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Gentiloni. Okay, perhaps it wasn't a portfolio with, from, of a millionaire. There was about 110,000 euros invested in Amazon. Um, so I hope then this won't discourage you in properly regulating these companies in the future. Second question, it concerns consistency. You say that we're going to, you're going to sanction the member states that are listed on the blacklist um, for tax havens. But what about members of the European Union? What about Ireland and Luxembourg, for example? And how can the European Union claim to be credible when uh, it is giving uh, succor to the, some of the worst tax havens in the world? What about my colleague who talked earlier on about this? There are countries who are blocking things at European
European level. They're not the big countries, they're the small countries like Luxembourg or Ireland, for instance. So we can see that the European Union is transforming. It's becoming a kind of race to the bottom in terms of um, tax competition. And people are getting more and more uh, intelligent with their aggressive tax planning. So what can you do to prevent this aggressive tax planning? Are you going to create a minimum uh, corporate rate for companies in Europe? Are you ready to force the member states or ask the member states to uh, be um, scrutinized in the same way that we scrutinize third country? When it comes to things that are blocked in the council, what about uh, tax transparency? That's also blocked in the council. Are you going to uh, re get around the impasse on country-by-country -country reporting? Uh, Thank you. Well... Aggressive tax planning between European member states is not something we can accept. It is a practice, a reality, that we simply cannot accept. So we've got to work on this. Then you've got the minimal taxation. That is one of the solutions. And you know that this hasn't really got out of the starting blocks in the council yet, but I do think uh, this is gaining momentum in public opinion. There's strength for this in the European Parliament. And... I think it's also a, a clear decision to be taken for the Econ Commissioner along with the College of Commissioners. And we're going to work on this and we're going to find solutions. Thank you. Now we move to the second round of questions. Uh, please let me remind you of the speaking time. So I will really kindly ask you to keep it strictly to one minute for questions and one minute for follow-up. Thank you. So now it's time for uh, José García Margallo y Marfil from EPP. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, welcome, Commissioner-designate. Now, in your intervention, you mentioned an economic slowdown. There are some people who think that we're facing something more serious. Some people think that uh, we're facing a crisis that won't be demand-based, uh, like the Lehman Brothers crisis, but a supply-based one. And that will be due to many factors that you know about, having been a prime minister, uh, tensions between the US and China, technological wars, uh, tariffs, Brexit, and uh, an oil price shock as a result of events in the Middle East. And if that is the case, the only solution can be structural reforms, but over the medium term, Mrs. Lagarde and, Mrs. and Mr. Draghi have said that uh, there needs to be more flexibility. Oh, yeah, it's, it's time to move away from monetary policy. We need to be more flexible on fiscal policy. So three questions. How, ca how long do you think we can remain stick with uh, historically low interest rates as we are at the moment? Secondly, flexibility. You're, we've discussed, are you looking at uh, investing in various sectors uh, and uh, are you going to be looking to create digital champions and uh, which structural reforms would have to be added to these policies which uh, I think would just be sticking plaster solutions to what potentially we face. And just to be clear, I was one of the people who called Marcus Fair but I'm not going to tell him uh, what you said, what I said, excuse me, but you can probably imagine. Uh, well, thank, thank you very much, Honorable Margallo. I, I'm not able to answer in Spanish, so I, I, will, <laughs> I will do in English. Um, yes, we have, uh, I was referring before to the uh, November forecast, because this institutionally for us is uh, the milestone. But in any way, everybody is looking to forecast uh, delivered by different institutions around the world and we know that uh, we have a uh, serious slowdown uh, and that this slowdown uh, could uh, uh, have a uh, 
longer lasting than expected six months on one year ago. We will see. So in this case, but in any case, uh, we can't rely only on uh, monetary policy. Then we are also discussing monetary policy decision. I am not commenting uh, the ECB decisions by definition. Uh, I will not comment the ECB decision. But we know, at least in this, I think we are all agreeing, that only monetary policy is not sufficient to face uh, a difficult situation and a possible uh, long-lasting uh, slowdown in our growth. Not recession, but growth slowing down. What should we add to this? A more coordinated fiscal policy, investments, and structural reforms. It is interesting, I think, that in the last Euro summit, one of the decisions that was taken concerned this budget instrument for convergence and competitiveness uh, aimed to encourage structural reforms. We will see how it will be funded and how it will be effective, but the aim is clear, and it is in the direction you were mentioning. Any follow-up? Well, I don't know what you dreamed about last night, uh, but you mentioned 27 budgets three times. There are still 28 of us. Now, fiscal fraud and customs, you mentioned those. And looking at Brexit, well, there's an issue with the Irish, Northern Irish border, and it's a major problem because it would set the precedent that the United Kingdom wants to use for relation, future relations between the UK and the rest of the EU. There have been people who've talked about a Singapore-style state being established on the other side of the channel. Now, we've also heard about uh, tax havens, and we have one in the EU, Gibraltar. There's no wealth tax, there's no sales tax. 0.15% tax on gambling and uh, business company tax is 10% and it's only applied to uh, a certain category of business which covers none of them. Now, Spanish governments had uh, have had some responsibility in causing the issues that surround Gibraltar but uh, what I want to know is what are we going to do on tax havens what do you think that we should do when it comes to not having a low tax regime uh, across the channel when it comes to future relations between the EU and the UK? I don't think that would be good for anyone. Uh, <clears throat> well, it should be very clear um, from our point of view that... Uh, the day after a uh, no-deal Brexit, UK uh, will, will be for us a third country. It is not what we wanted, it is not what was our project, but it is, could be the autonomous decision of the United Kingdom. We will see. I, I have seen the dialogue uh, between uh, Jean-Claude Juncker and the British Prime Minister. Uh, for us, I only make two points. One, uh, the Irish border will not be a hard border. We have, we have to give full respect to the Good Friday agreements. We can't uh, create a new enormous problem in Europe after Brexit in Ireland. Second point, I remember the difficulties when we had the deal with Prime Minister May about Gibraltar. In this case, 
an agreement was reached in some way, in some way, by your govern from your government and uh, EU and UK, we have to keep these commitments. Thank you. Uh, now Joachim Schuster from SND. Thank you very much, Commissioner Designate. The Economic and Monetary Union is quite restrictive in economic and finance policy. Budgetary consolidation and uh, compliance with debt constraints. The political guidelines from Ursula von der Leyen talk about sustainable European investment plans. 1,000 billion investment. Now, this is a substantial sum, but this sort of investment can't be generated entirely in the, the private sector, so the public sector is going to have to play a very key role in dealing with market failure, in giving a fillip to investment, in promoting sustainability and green investment to tackle climate change. The European Green Deal, green deal is going to need to align both public and private investment. It's going to have to bring in a lot of the energy sector investment objectives as well. Do you believe in green bonds? And what do you think about the future of economic and finance policy and how we should scrutinise this going forward? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Honourable Schuster. Um, yes, the European Green Deal is a uh, very big priority in the new commission. Uh, President von der Leyen make it very clear. And personally, I, I really agree with this. Um, the, the one trillion uh, uh, figure is very impressive. I agree with you. Um, I think we will work um, very strongly uh, personally, uh, with Vice President uh, Timmermans, with Vice President uh, Dombrovskis, uh, because we need to create the good environment to mobilize uh, private capitals, obviously. But I think that to reach uh, such a commitment, we need to join to join to capital, to private investment, also public grants and um, mobilizing public uh, investments around Europe. This plan, the Sustainable Europe Investment Plan, uh, is uh, starting in parallel with the Invest EU plan, and I think that Invest EU plan. Uh, will give to the sustainable plan a strong contribution because of the capacities that Invest EU uh, hub, uh, as we call it, will have to uh, contribute a new project capable of having strong capital participation. Uh, we should also continue in the ongoing work on defining a uh, standard for green bonds. This, I think, is uh, one of our uh, goals for the near future. And the work is already ongoing, as you know. Any follow-up? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, eine erfolgreiche Umsetzung eine yes, an effective implementation of such an investment strategy is vital. We need to deliver the ecological transformation of the economy. This would improve our competitiveness vis-à-vis -vis external competitors. Fair competition conditions are essential, and we do need to have a border carbon tax, which C Commission President Designate Ursula von der Leyen has mentioned. What do you think would be the cornerstones of such a border tax arrangement. Thank you. It's, uh, as I said, is an ongoing work in our uh, uh, ECFIN uh, services. 
the message uh, is very clear, I think. There is a growing um, uh, investment, uh, capital investment uh, availability all over the world on uh, investment with a purpose and specifically on investment with environmental purpose. So uh, our capacity to give uh, with our green bonds a benchmark to the markets I think will be very useful and appreciated and will fall in a very positive and favorable uh, env environment from investors. It would be strange that EU uh, could be absent in this field that is now very, very positive all over the world in capitals. Thank you. Before giving the floor to the next speaker, I just remind you that we run 15 minutes late, so please uh, try to keep the time uh, for a form of respect for the next speakers. So, uh, Gilles Boyer, uh, Renew Europe. Thank you very much indeed, Commissioner Designate. I'm over here. I'm over here. During the last electoral campaign, I was very surprised to often receive questions from citizens about tax harmonisation within the European Union. I thought it was a technical subject, but I've discovered now that it's a political issue that concerns a lot of our fellow citizens. And if I judge from the questions here today, not just uh, French citizens. So you touched on this, and I thank you for that. We all agree that the response of the European Union is not equal to the expectations of citizens today, particularly because of the unanimity procedure, which has also been mentioned. So I think we need to have uh, a unanimous decision to get rid of unanimity. That's a paradox that we have to address. And I'm not certain that we'll be able to get unanimity on that decision, but where there are enough of us who want this mandate to be marked and characterised by real progress in this area. We've, I've always been taught in life that when you get a big problem to deal with, you can't solve it in one or two minutes. Instead, you've got to try to unpick the problem and look at it in small, as small tasks that one by one can be more accessibly dealt with. So my question is then, what is the first thing con concretely that you will be proposing to make sure that our mandate, that I hope we will be running together, will be characterised by a, a proper step in the right direction to help and satisfy European citizens? Thank you. Uh, bon, merci. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Boyer, you rightly said that we have to have unanimity to agree on getting rid of unanimity. That's going to be very difficult, uh, not just apparently, but it is going to be very difficult. But in my introductory remarks, I said that we needed to make uh, an exceptional political effort here. And it's politics then, in support of public opinion and stakeholders and general awareness of the countries in a different position that will help us get through. Now, Article 116 is a bit different, though, because if there are clear re legal arguments, then maybe that might get a bit clearer, a bit easier, possibly. But with the passerelle clause, we were going to have to have an enormous political impetus. Just one small example for you. And this will be one of my initiatives that I would take. When the European Council decided not to pursue the digital tax idea, the three countries that weren't on board said that they weren't in opposition generally, 
but rather they wanted to wait and see how consensus might be built at an international level. So that would be something that we could see over the next few months, and then there's a possibility of revisiting this whole thing in 2020. I'll stop. I'm sorry, but... 30 seconds then. I just want to say that you touched on international negotiations, global negotiations in, G in the context of the G20 and the OECD, but clearly the European Union won't be strong in those negotiations unless it can show a united front. Um, so we have to already thrash out common positions here, and uh, many of us here are very much sensitive to these issues over the next few months. And so I hope that if you are confirmed, this will also be your work to be done as well. Oh. Yes, of course. I'll try to do this in the best possible way. I do think we have uh, more of a chance on this discussion within the OECD than we had perhaps a few months ago. I'm not 100% optimistic, but uh, I would say that I'm less pessimistic today than I was a few months ago because the discussion between the European countries and the US has now made some progress and I think there's a little bit of margin there to be able to thrash out a solution, I hope. Now, Jose Manuel Fernandez, uh, Employment EPP. Presidente, caro Comissario. Madam Chair, Commissioner Designate, you, together with the Commissioner for Jobs, are responsible for the impact of external shocks on member states. Now, we've already heard here the about the Unemployment Benefit Reinsurance Scheme. This is an ambitious project, but it's not clear what your position is supposed to be on this. At the end of the day, is this project going to be based on subsidies, or is it going to be based on loans to member state, or is it going to be a mix of both elements? And then, is it going to be for all member states of the European Union, or just Eurozone member states? What would be the requirements the Member States would have to respect in order to be able to access this benefit, Unemployment Benefit Reinsurance Scheme? Uh, well, thank you, Honorable Fernandez. The, the task I was given in my letter mission, mission letter is the definition uh, of this scheme. Uh, so it is a task that I, I will not conclude this task in, in our hearing because it is uh, not uh, so uh, evident. You were uh, already uh, stressing the main issues that we have to deal with um, and I've, I've already said what this tool should not be. No permanent transfer, no uh, weakening of structural reforms, uh, and to be an uh, automatic uh, disbursement mechanism. Then we will uh, discuss exactly the uh, three, two or three issues you were saying. Um, loans or uh, support to budget. Obviously, especially in this situation of the financial markets, uh, loans is a uh, weaker um, tool than uh, direct support to budgets. But direct support to budget uh, needs to be highly funded uh, because if you have external shocks uh, relevant and in several countries uh, to give support to budget without a relevant and serious funding uh, is not feasible. Uh, someone is studying, and in the definition we will talk about this, of the possibility of having uh, an 
initial uh, scheme based on loans and a transition towards a uh, direct support to budget. We will see it, I assure you, in the next weeks because I'm tasked to do this definition very quickly and we'll do it together. Pergunta é se uh, vai seguir o um método comunitário. Is there going to be a community method to bring this uh, benefit reinsurance scheme into being and to decide on things? I mean, if they're loans, they'll have to be guarantees within the budget. So. What, how high do you think that guarantee should be? That's the question. Or, if they're subsidies, then there will have to be a contribution made from somewhere. And has this financial contribution already been decided on? Up to what limit are we talking? Practically, you answered uh, to, to your questions, because the, uh, what we have to define implies that in the case of uh, a scheme... Uh, with uh, loans or in the case of the scheme with support to the budget we have different consequences on the, on the first uh, case these consequences are relatively easier to tackle in the second case the direct transfer they imply also to be discussed in our uh, multi-annual financial framework because they need to have a uh, funding in our uh, multi-annual financial framework. So this will be, uh, I think, in a few weeks, uh, the definition of the scheme and of the conse different consequences on our methods in our community decisions. Thank you. Iro, <coughs> Iro Einau Loma, S&D. Uh, Mr. Gentiloni, you have a really impressive political CV, and I do think that when you have tough duties waiting you, it's an advantage. One of the big team is taxation. I have also got some phone calls, and people have been urging that the European Union ought to go further on the field of taxation so that we can be sure that everybody pays its share of tax. And in this respect, a fair digital, digital taxation is essential, as has been mentioned here. Uh, can you specify your main priorities regarding taxation of large multinationals and particularly the tech giants? And second, could you outline how you see your role in the ongoing international negotiations on digital taxation. Uh, well, thank you, Honorable Heina Um Well, it is um, the the target is clear. I think uh, the digital. Uh, a revolution brought for the first time to a situation that we cannot accept that uh, value uh, is created and is created frequently uh, through uh, data and through our data, our personal data. But taxes are not uh, in the same places where value is created. So this, I think, is uh, totally unacceptable. Uh, my uh, uh, point is, um, well, we decided after some diffic internal difficulties in the, uh, among member states in delivering on the Commission proposal, uh, we decided to uh, try to take the best from the international uh, discussion, from G20 and OECD discussion. 
uh, when this was decided, it could appear uh, like a sort of exit strategy uh, in front of difficulties. But now, what I understand is that there is a real worry uh, from uh, coming from, especially from the United States, real concern and a real availability to find compromise in OECD. Europe is having a very relevant role in this case, and I am rather optimistic that we can find solution at global level next year. Any follow-up? Yes. Uh, Mr. Centuloni, in your written response, you said that uh, if there is an absence of an international agreement, it will come forward with a European proposal on digital tax. So is it so that we can wait the results either from the, Euro uh, from the worldwide negotiations or from the proposal of the Commission already on next year, 2020? Uh, yes, my program is very clear. Uh, if there is no consensus emerging next year, uh, we will have a European proposal. This means that in the uh, third quarter of next year we will work on the European proposal. We will not jump the gun of the European proposal during the uh, international uh, debate, uh, but I, I'm very uh, serious in committing myself and the Commission uh, to have our proposal uh, next year if the international consensus is not there. Thank you. Ernst Urtasun from the Greens. Sí, señor Gentiloni, gracias uh, por su presencia aquí. Uh, Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Gentiloni, for being here. You know that we have a slowdown ahead of us and we're going to have to invoke the stabilisation arrangements that we have and we're going to have to look at rectifying some of the mistakes we've made in the past So, we, because we've made serious mistakes which we mustn't replicate. We need to make progress with the reforms which you've already alluded to we need to look at the two-pack and six-pack and review them, and I'm glad to hear you say that. I'd like to hear from you more about the fiscal policy and the cyclical approach to the proposals that you'll be putting forward. President Draghi spoke in very much those terms, that we need to look at current provisions and see whether they are too cyclical and what we could do to change them so that we don't exacerbate the cyclical effect on the economy, which simply exacerbates existing problems. Thank you. Well, the risk of uh, pro-cyclical uh, effect is very clear. Uh, I think that the European Fiscal Board uh, also stated this risk in a very clear way. What we will uh, have to discuss uh, at the end of the review that is ongoing at, that will be concluded middle of December of the two-pack and six-pack is the way forward uh, because the I personally I have to say appreciated the European Fiscal Board uh, philosophy uh, um, <clears throat> simple enforceable and anti-cyclical. Uh, and this uh, philosophy uh, is also considering many objections that were made also this morning towards uh, some uh, too complicated and too discretionary elements of the uh, SGP rules until now. But we have to know that the decision uh, on how to uh, go forward after the review uh, will be taken uh, by the college and by European institutions and it will not be an easy decision. Uh, 
Personally, I always stress the word ambition, so I would like very much to change uh, in a more uh, anti-cyclical, more simple and more enforceable way our rules. But I respect the opinion that says, okay, be cautious because we can solve the same problem with some interpretation tools and without opening the box of legislative change. We will decide before the end of this year. Follow up. Gran parte recaerá en usted la posibilidad de construir. I think that a lot will come back to you to contribute to creating a political dynamic that will actually drive policy forward in this direction. I think that it's very important to look at the regulations, but it's also important to look at the macroeconomic framework. You've commented on this in writing in the past, and I think that it's been suggested that perhaps we haven't had a symmetric application of the macroeconomic imbalance procedure. How do you think that we can ensure that we don't exacerbate imbalances in the housing market as a result of the way we implement this policy? Thank you. <coughs> uh, yes, the analysis of macro imbalances uh, I think was very uh, helpful um, because it, it was useful uh, to give uh, both the Commission and Member States a uh, guidelines, ideas, suggestions, not only uh, on the traditional uh, financial issues, but on other issues uh, that are uh, the private debt, the housing market, as we are saying, the health situation, uh, these conditions are fundamental, and I think that we should work on strengthening them in the near future. Thank you. Francesca Donato from ID. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I will speak in Italian. Mr. Gentiloni. We saw your written responses to the Parliament's questionnaire, and there you said that you were going to support growth and find the right balance between sustainability and solving short-term problems via appropriate flexibility within the EU rules of the EU. What do you mean specifically by appropriate flexibility? What are the parameters that you will adopt and which variables will you take account of when it comes to deciding whether to give a member state more or less budgetary flexibility? Will you continue to apply the current criteria, which are essentially political, which means that uh, those governments which are closer to your political positions get more flexibility, or will you introduce more objective uh, uh, criteria which take account of growth perspectives and the need for individual member states to invest? Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Donato. Flexibility is subject to rules in the sense that we have rules set out by a commission communication which updated the Stability and Growth Pact. We therefore know what the key parameters are, the parameters which will be used during the essential dialogue between the Commission and Member States' governments, which then establish the fle limits of the flexibility. I am confident in this dialogue. There are the government's uh, national reform plans. They're crucial. Investments are key. You all know that there is a specific clause that deals with investments. In addition, exceptional circumstances are taken account of. Circumstances that a member state may well be subject to as a result of unforeseen extraordinary circumstances. When it comes to this flexibility, 
I don't think that there should be a discretionary political element that dominates. I respect your view, which uh, I imagine is different to mine, but as Commissioner for the Economy, if confirmed, I think that uh, the criterion of flexibility needs to be based on the rules that are set out in our system. Follow up? Yes. Thank you. In order to relaunch growth in the Eurozone, you quite correctly recall that it's necessary to adopt expansive policies and implement productive public spending. Unfortunately, though, countries with a high level of public debt like Italy are called to be prudent so that they can remain within the budgetary limits established by the fiscal compact. However, there are areas such as the south of Italy which need more development and given that, will you finally adopt the golden rule for investments in infrastructure and research and co-financing for cohesion funds, taking that kind of public expenditure out of the calculation of public debt? Thank you. But certainly... Well... I think that dialogue under the European semester with individual dialogues already envisages through the investment clause that uh, there is more flexibility applied to those two countries depending on their public sector investment plans. The introduction of the golden rule is something that is under discussion. There is an opinion from the European Fiscal Board, which I have referred to several times, and that opinion explicitly envisages a change depend related to uh, public sector investments that uh, relate to environmental issues. So this is a very serious issue that will be discussed during coming months. Thank you very much. I should like to come back to the Stability and Growth Pact, and I'd like to ask some specific questions on that. First of all, I'd like to think whether you think it's useful and effective to intervene on the resources allocated to individual member states, i.e. the cohesion funds. Is it useful to intervene in that area? Ms. von der Leyen has invoked some very important investment programmes designed to stimulate growth, and she's talked also about the revision of the Stability and Growth Pact. In that context, I'd like to hear from you what you think is feasible. Do you think it is possible to alter the co-financing percentage within the Stability and Growth Pact because the principle is really that on one, the one hand you give and on the other hand you block funds because they are blocked under certain provisions of the Stability and Growth Pact. So both the President-elect and you yourself seem to have suggested that something could be done to alter this. So could you expand on that please and tell us a bit more about it because it would actually have a big impact on socio-economic inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fito. First of all, thank you very much for your question. What I would say is this. The legitimacy of raising that issue is beyond question. It's something which has been much discussed at European level and indeed for some time. I'd just like to use your question really as a jumping off point in order to refer briefly to something which I think the Commission as a European institution needs to avoid and that is a risk. The risk that we look at revising our rules and we are currently looking at a review of the six-pack and the two-pack and that we go down the wrong track with this and 
imagine that it can actually resolve all the problems that are on our current agenda. They may come from di di different political perspectives and uh, geographical and financial backgrounds, but there are many issues that are very relevant that we need to address. I'm not against a review and addressing these issues, but I am aware of the fact that the SGP can't resolve everything any more than reviews to the two-pack and the six-pack can. So if we are going to review them, then we need to be very selective in identifying the priorities that we want to achieve, and we must not think that they are a kind of panacea, nor can we take what I might describe as a kind of artichoke approach and just be selective, peeling off what we want, thinking that we will stabilise in one area and give exemptions in another. We've got to have a much more comprehensive approach. We need to stabilise, we need a comprehensive approach to channelling the right kind of investment. Cohesion is clearly vitally important too. But all this is really subject to the paramount principle of prioritising and having a broad overview so that we get the right policies and so that we introduce the right legislative proposals to modify the SGP. As I hope I have already conveyed, we need to have a clear interpretation of our objectives and clear goals. And some of the things that we could conceive of will be completely unrealistic in the context of the scope for manoeuvre we have. I apologise for going over my time. When Follow-up question. Yes, please. Well, still following the same rationale and the same logic and indeed following some questions that have been raised earlier on today on the question of financial stability legislation applying in varying dif various different countries. I'd like to ask you a further question. I wonder what you think would be advisable in terms of flexibility. Would it be a good idea to do something to ensure that there is not too great a margin of flexibility in public expenditure in individual member states so that there has to be a clear objective to public investment and public finances so that national public finances are managed within the overall framework of the Stability and Growth Pact. I think that in a number of different countries there are proposals which will actually not be conducive to keeping public expenditure under control, won't deliver the necessary investment and actually will exacerbate negative economic trends and indicators and this is all too common across the Eurozone. Thank you. Sì, è chiaro che dovremmo concentrare Thank you. Yes, clearly we do need to have a major focus on investment and on structural reform because that's what will drive growth in our economies. And if we look at the balance sheet of recent years, then I think it takes only a few words to sum up the facts. We see the Stability and Growth Pact has avoided major worse economic crises and it's been useful in driving down deficits, but it has not been successful or not sufficiently successful in driving down debt levels and it has not been successful in facilitating growth and the sort of investment and structural reform which we urgently need to see. It's for these reasons that the reviews, revisions that are in, going to be implemented really need to focus on this. Thank you. And from the Budget Committee, EPP. Thank you, Madam President. Commissioner Designate, I would like to discuss with you the impact of your decisions upon the budget of the European Union and upon the financing of the European Union because it is clear that after Brexit we will need additional resources to finance our current priorities and our new priorities. And this is why the discussion about own resources of the European Union is now more important than ever. You should lead the work on the implementation of the carbon border tax, and this is why my first question is, do you see the carbon border tax implemented into the system of own resources of the European Union? My second question is, the Commission has tried before and failed to implement a system of own resources. What will you do differently? Because now more than ever we need commissioners who succeed. And how will you convince member states to make progress on own resources? And my third question also on the carbon border taxes, how will you implement it in order not to negatively affect the competitiveness of our industry? Thank you. Uh, well, about uh, own resources. Um, yes, in fact, many of them are uh, in my uh, portfolio. In, <laughs> they are not mine. 
Um, um, yes. Um, no, two things. One, uh, we have um, we, uh, our uh, custom union uh, tariff um, is fundamental for our uh, own resources. Uh, there is a, a discussion on the 10% the or 20% uh, that should be uh, in the member state um, uh, capacity uh, and in the EU capacity. The discussion will uh, go on. On VAT, I don't see uh, immediate uh, consequence of our uh, decisions and reforms on VAT on the own uh, resources. As far as the new own resources tool are uh, concerned, um, the um, potential uh, own resources coming from taxation, uh, both on the so-called carbon border tax and on the uh, common uh, corporate tax base, um, uh, are uh, something that we have to work very seriously if we want them there at the beginning of the uh, multi-annual financial framework because um, it is not, uh, I, I think, evident that this contribution could be already there uh, in, in the next month. So this is something that with your committee we have to discuss. Um, I think we will try to be very quick and effective on the carbon border tax, but the legal and technical elements to define are not simple, as you know. Follow up. Uh, thank you very much. Well, all of these difficulties, you know, we have known so far, but that's why I say we need more now. And uh, particularly given that you're a former minister, we need a commissioner capable of convincing member states. When you spoke about your portfolio before, I immediately had to think about your portfolio of shares and about Amazon, of course. And that's why my next question is EU digital tax. Do you see that also integrated in own resources? My first question and my second one is... Um, uh, what magnitude uh, do you foresee for the own resources as part of the next budget? And given that you are a commissioner for economy and not a commissioner for the future of Europe or culture, I would appreciate a more concrete answer. Thank you. Uh, yes, my idea would be to have a, a stronger basis of own resources. Uh, because a, a budget only based on GNI, uh, I think, is uh, interesting, uh, probably inevitable, uh, but weak for our uh, union and our future. So we have to strengthen our own resources. Uh, the former commission uh, indicated uh, three ways to, to strengthen them. I will work in those connected with my portfolio with all the political strength and the determination that, that I can have. This is what I can assure you. Thank you. Now, Engin Eroglu from Renew Europe. Sehr geehrt, Herr Gentiloni, für sehr viele Bürger, Mr. Gentiloni, for myself and many citizens, the principle of responsibility is an important concept. It's only people who act for themselves that are free in their taking a decision. You're dealing with important uh, levels of resources, but these kinds of uh, ownership of decision is important in private life as well. So what I'm worried about is uh, moral hazard. This is an issue for countries within the EU. You need to be liable for your actions when it comes to taxpayers' money, and that is the basis of the no-bailout principle. 
That's also anchored in the Maastricht Treaty. No member state can take on liabilities for another one. Do you stand by that principle of no bailouts? That's my question. Uh, I, I didn't hear the initial part of your, uh, the, the beginning of your question because I, I, I hadn't put my micro. I heard the two thirds, but not the initial part of your question. Okay. Well, in the first part, I just said that for many citizens and for me personally, own responsibility is an important principle, and uh, that is something that relates to people's use of resources, and that's what led me on to this no bailout principle question. Uh, yes, it is a, a shared principle. Uh, I think we have to uh, to share the principle of resp common responsibility, uh, and this is what I will uh, exercise in my uh, mandate. Uh, so I I agree with what you are you are you are saying. I couldn't add more. Any follow up? And um, möchte ich Ihnen nochmal. And now let me refer back to your introductory comments. I'd like to thank you for those. And you mentioned taxation for environmental purposes and also the digital tax. Now, the previous speaker also brought that up. And you gave the impression that uh, in Europe and internationally, you're going to work to try and find a solution to these, the issue of digital giants. Could you perhaps be a bit clearer on how these taxes are going to work? Are they going to be levied at the national level or at the European level, for example? <coughs> well, it's going to be an international commitment. Switch to English. It was a spontaneous reaction <laughs> uh, in Italian. Um, yes, the, we will have a, an international commitment on on, uh, on digital taxation. Um, uh, I think that we have now the concrete possibility to uh, to reach a result. It was not the, the case. Uh, until a few months ago. The evolution of the discussion in the OECD uh, framework uh, is uh, mostly going uh, towards a uh, general uh, taxation of uh, big business. Uh, not only uh, digital platforms, but big business in general. Uh, I think that this is acceptable because the digitalization is going on in all multinationals and not only in digital multinationals. And this is something that Euro can uh, easily uh, accept. Thank you. Pier Nicola Pedicini. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner-designate, for being here and asking, answering so many questions. I have seen that you're going to have a daunting array of tasks. I'm not going to come back to green investment, but I have read that you are going to be responsible for delivering sustainable development goals in the context of investment. So I'd like to hear more about that. You're also to be responsible for guaranteeing that the SGP rules are complied with. How do you intend to unleash green investment so countries with a high public debt who don't have much scope for investment can nevertheless invest in green investment? We can't tackle climate change without green investment and it should be appropriate to have similar levels of investment across the European Union where, but some countries will be constrained by their public sector deficits. I'd also like to know about the austerity policies that have been implemented in the past. You have always voted 
to implement these austerity policies. And we've seen what the implications of that have been. We've seen the crisis, the economic crisis and the recession, which has taken root in many places in Europe. And the European Union has only exacerbated existing socio-economic divergences between countries in the European Union. So could you expand on what you would intend to do yourself? Do you intend to continue to imp implement these failed austerity policies in Europe or not? Thank you very much. You mentioned our rules and the Stability and Growth Pact, and rightly so. And you mentioned also that they haven't necessarily generated enough investment, structural investment, which in turn would uh, reduce public deficits. I think that we do need to observe that we have rules in place and that in places they have worked more effectively than others on a in certain areas they have worked more effectively than others. We have to some extent avoided worse crises than we might otherwise have seen. But these rules certainly can perfectly legitimately be criticised. What I would say is this. First of all, the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact already do provide for incentives to public sector investment. I've already mentioned the question of flexibility. So flexibility in terms of investment is already a part of the current rules. Then what I would say secondly is that there are other factors we need to bear in mind. And this is something which doesn't just apply to our countries. It applies more widely. Often trying to generate public investment is something which is a function of many different things, not just the way the rules work, in this case the, the European rules, but other factors. And in other countries, there can, in our individual countries and others, there can be difficulties in generating the investment at the pace that you need, the pace that will actually deliver the policy results that you need. So you need to have the resources, but you also, in the European context, need to comply with the constraints. Solo per dire che, uh... Just to say then, since Mr. Pedicini, since you mentioned Italy, that Italy is constrained by a European mechanism and an Italian mechanism, which mean that public debt and deficit is at a level that does not enable substantial public investment, which is what we need. The ECB can't intervene in primary markets, but if it were possible to do this sort of thing, then huge resources, we after all have a primary surplus, huge resources would be available, but at the moment the constraints of the system are such that we can't use them. Thank you. Io rispetto la sua opinion. Yes, I respect your opinion. But what I would say is we need to do and play our part in terms of the European rules, we need to make them as effective as we can in generating the necessary investment. We must try to ensure to the best we can that they don't constitute a hurdle to investment in individual countries. Uh, SND. Gentiloni, in the past there has been imbalance of the social, environmental and economic policies at EU level. And it's now essential to bring economic governance more in line with the social objectives of the treaties. Um, and as Commission President-elect Ursula von der Leyen stressed, that it is high time to reconcile the social and the market in today's economy. The question is, how do you intend to strengthen the social dimension of the semester process and what will you do to achieve more upward convergence, because that is the goal, really, of all. And will you bring forward a legislative proposal to include an annual assessment of income inequality, social housing, wage developments, and collective agreement coverage? Uh, well, thank you, Honorable Bishop. I am personally uh, strongly committed also on the basis of my 
uh, personal experience as uh, Prime Minister uh, on the fact that we need, uh, uh, first of all, uh, cooperation with social partners in our uh, economical choices. Uh, and so the, the, this will be together with the, my colleague uh, Nicholas Schmidt, my uh, commitment. Um, as far as of our rules are concerned, uh, the uh, European semester uh, in the last couple of years uh, began to seriously include uh, social dimension in its process. Uh, this was uh, mostly the consequence of the uh, uh, Göteborg uh, decision about the European social pillar. Um, I think that now uh, this uh, task should uh, go on beyond this and it is clear the mandate that I received uh, to uh, integrate the sustainable development goals of United Nations uh, with the process of the European semester. Um, as we all know, the SDG goals has a strong social dimension, not only a strong environmental dimension. And this will be, I think, a new tool to give to this uh, social priority the room that it deserves. Follow up. Thank you. Um, I think, I nevertheless think that a legal instrument would be very essential, especially also uh, in the connection of the initiative on minimum wages in Europe. But I'm very happy that you stress the role of the social partners, and my question is how in concrete what will you do to strengthen the role of the social partners in the European semester on European and on national level? Well, by the way, I obviously agree on the minimum wage proposal. It's, uh, I didn't mention it because it is not directly in my portfolio, but in the college I will strongly support it. Um, what will, will I do on the semester? I think that we need, it is also a problem of uh, public awareness uh, to involve social partners uh, also in member states in the dialogue that we will have with uh, member states' governments. Uh, this would help this dialogue and will help the European Union to a better understanding on what we are deciding uh, during the semester towards member states. Thank you. And now, Ludek Niedermayer, EPP. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gentiloni. I'm actually looking over your shoulders <laughs> from behind. This is what Parliament uh, does from time to time. <laughs> Let me go back to tax issues. And I noted uh, with um, the great satisfaction that you actually dedicate uh, the biggest portion of your written answers to tax issues. And you talk quite extensively about your strategy in digital taxation. I want to ask you about two other proposals that were favorably accepted by previous Parliament. This is CCTB and VAT reform, and I guess they are very important for, for, for the Europe and for economy of a single market, but they are hopelessly blocked uh, in the Council. So I wonder what kind of concrete steps you would like to take in order to unblock these proposals. Thank you. <coughs> well, thank you, Honorable Niedermeyer. I, I don't know if I had to address the, the room or... or Okay. Um, thank you, Honorable Niedermeyer. Um, yes, the, the VAT uh, reform and the CCTB uh, are, are two main issues of this uh, tax portfolio. Uh, as far as the VAT reform is concerned, uh, I think that we have uh, recently delivered uh, relevant uh, decisions 
especially uh, concerning the uh, uh, the e-commerce uh, and that uh, the implementation of this decision uh, will be uh, very uh, relevant for member states in the near future. Um, the uh, general uh, proposal of uh, reform of VAT uh, is something that I will uh, bring forward. Uh, taking, uh, uh, taking in account the fact that the uh, um, uh, reforms that we uh, recently decided need uh, in the immediate uh, period uh, some commitment from member states. So it will not be uh, my immediate priority, the VAT, but uh, perhaps uh, after uh, a few quarters in uh, 2020. Uh, as far as CCTB uh, is concerned, uh, this is a absolute priority because we can't continue uh, with the, uh, this uh, internal competition among member states. Uh, it is connected to the international evolution of the uh, discussion in OECD framework, but personally I will not wait uh, and I will uh, suggest to go on on this proposal. Yes, quick follow-up. Thank you. You can count on my support. Uh, the the follow-up is on border adjustment tax because I guess it's very important for fair trade. How long do you think it will take to come with the, with the sp concrete proposal taking into the account that technically speaking it's uh, difficult? And when do you think it could be earliest uh, implemented? Uh, I think we should move quickly on the so-called carbon border tax. We all know the uh, legal uh, and technical constraints, uh, but this uh, shouldn't mean waiting for us. Uh, it is possible to have uh, this adjustment measure compatible with WTO uh, rules, and we have to work on this immediately. Thank you. Jose Guzmao from GUE, still here on your shoulders. Obrigado, Sr. President. Comissário Indigitado, também estou aqui atrás. Thank you very much indeed. I'm just back here behind you. I think it's clear that the European Commission has been much more active in terms of putting pressure on deficit economies and indebted economies in the European Union than those with uh, surplus and those with a budgetary uh, leeway. The, the European Union or the European Commission is demanding cuts and it's actually not been sufficiently demanding in asking for investments. And I think this shows unequal treatment. I think it's backsliding, really, in terms of economic policies of the European Union. And then the European Economic and Monetary Union has uh, macroeconomic imbalances, which are systematic, and that isn't sustainable in the longer term. So I'd like to know if you're going to defend the exclusion of the deficit for the SGP and what are you going to do with the surpluses which are systematic that we have seen across the board. Thank you very much. Um, and we've also seen this, sorry, in the reports. Thank you. Guzmao, we have our rules and uh, I think the rules are not changing according to the uh, economic environment and what happens in our global economy. Uh, but mm, this doesn't mean that they are uh, that our econom economic policy is always the same. So for sure, we had a very deep crisis ten years ago, uh, and also long-lasting. This deep crisis created 
huge debt problems in several countries and this one, one was one of the main concern of our economic policies. Uh, I think that we were rather effective in managing deficits and in keeping debt stable, but not yet enough reducing. Now we are facing, and we are gradually better understanding what is the degree, we are facing a rather different economic environment because our growth is slowing down and it is not clear at what extent and for how long. In this situation, I think that our economic policies should be strongly oriented pro-growth, pro-investment and asking to those that have fiscal space to use it to relaunch our growth. This is, doesn't mean changing rules, it means adapting our rules to the changement of the economic situation in Europe. Follow up. Uma das, um dos problemas da, das economias endividadas. One of the problems of indebted economies is that every year some of the fiscal revenues that have to be paid are expropriated and end up in other fiscal or tax jurisdictions. And this actually includes some of the member states with reference to the Economic and Monetary Union. So this is unfair competition in terms of fiscal competition. And when it comes to corporate tax uh, rates, we have to solve that problem. If you look at uh, Article 116, can we actually uh, go through with that? Do you want to apply Article 116 to actually apply the CCCTB with a minimum uh, tax uh, uh, rate? I said, and I, I repeat that we cannot accept to uh, maintain a situation of uh, aggressive competition uh, within the union based on different uh, corporate taxation. So we will progress with this proposal using all the legal tools that are available with the difficulties that we know but with the political strength that together the Commission and the Parliament will put in this task. Thank you. Uh, Robert Bidron, S&D, from the Budget Committee. Madam Chair, I understood I was next on the list. Uh, can you please, uh, that's, I haven't the list as an honorable Bidron. I, I don't know if... Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm looking at the list. <laughs> okay, we go on the next on the list. Damien Böselager from the Budget Committee from the Greens. No? Sorry. Emptied. No, so he's his slot. I can't read your name, sorry. We can. Uh, okay, I'm John Howarth from the United Kingdom and from the Budget Committee, and the list was amended. Okay, sorry, um, I apologize. Okay, ma uh, uh, Madam We didn't President, know. Madam President, thank you. Um, Commissioner Designate, in her mission letter, the President of the Commission tasked you with setting up and implementing the Sustainable Europe Investment Plan and the coordination of the future InvestEU programme. Simultaneously, Commissioner Dombrovskis would be in charge of coordinating the work of the Sustainable Europe Investment Plan with the objective of achieving 1 trillion euros of climate-related investment over the next decade. 
Council and Parliament reached a partial agreement on the InvestEU programme in the previous legislature. How do you see the division of tasks and responsibilities between Commissioner Dombrovskis and yourself regarding the Sustainable Investment Plan and what, if any, could be the impacts and consequences of this new plan on the InvestEU programme? Uh, well, well, thank you, Honourable. In general, I, I am sure that we uh, will work in good cooperation with uh, Vice President Dombrovskis. Um, in this case, we have, uh, also in this case, in many other cases, we have to coordinate our uh, work. Um, we have two different tools. Uh, one, invest EU, uh, is uh, something that you already discussed, the Parliament, uh, in the framework of the multi-annual financial framework, and it is targeted to different uh, priorities, uh, and will have, I think, a technical strong capacity in its invest EU hub, that will uh, also be very useful to uh, promote the investment of the uh, Sustainable uh, Europe Plan. So we will work hand in hand. If you want uh, Dombrovskis more specializing, so to say, on uh, raising uh, private capitals in the project uh, of uh, sustainable uh, euro investment plan we have as you know an ambitious target of 1 trillion euros and myself uh, more concentrating in the definition of the plan and the uh, promotion of invest eu program we need several tools to leverage investment, we have, we need a lot of investment for Europe and for the ecological transition. Thank you. Follow up. Madam President, simple follow up. Um, I would hope that all of the investment that's made under European Union programs would be climate-friendly investment and sustainable investment. And I would like to know from you what you think the key mechanisms are to ensuring that that's the case uh, in InvestEU and also in the other programs. Uh, yes, we have a, a uh, environmentally, environmental proofing methodology uh, raised in, in recent uh, times in our services uh, looking to the environmental dimension of all investments. Uh, for example, in Invest EU, there is the infrastructure uh, sector or investment that is uh, dedicated to sustainable infrastructures. But all the other aspects of these investments, and for Invest EU priorities, as you know, are environment, digital, social investment, education and skills, and sustainable infrastructure, the environmental dimension will be granted with a clear methodology. Thank you. Uh, Damien Böselager from the Budget Committee, the Greens. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Gentiloni, young people I'm here. Young people were hit especially hard by the last financial and economic crisis, depriving many of the chance to find their first job with severe long-term economic consequences, but also severe psychological consequences. So let me ask more in detail about potentially our first ever fiscal instrument, uh, the budgetary instrument on convergence and competitiveness. Some important characteristics remain still unclear, especially when it comes to A, size, and B, flexibility of the tool. So, first, will you dismiss the just the tool logic to allow money to flow where it is needed? And two, will you support upsizing mechanisms to allow the instrument to increase the resilience of the Eurozone? And three, 
Do you believe that the BACC should also deliver macroeconomic stabilization? Uh, yes, I think that the, uh, the proposal that was uh, confirmed in the Euro Summit in June uh, of this new instrument, the, the budget instrument from competitiveness and uh, BICC uh, <laughs> uh, and convergence, uh, is a relevant um, need to be uh, seriously uh, funded uh, and uh, should be uh, considered as also as a tool for uh, stabilization. Um, we know that the discussion on stabilization tool has always been difficult in the European Council, but this proposal, I think, is very targeted. The, uh, the target is uh, to strengthen uh, structural reforms and convergence, and it should be seriously funded and uh, should have a serious follow-up. And this is the commitment that I personally uh, take uh, with your committee. Follow up. What do you see the role of the European Parliament and especially the Budget Committee in particular in setting the governance um, and criteria for the discharge of the BICC and will you include the criteria of climate efficiency in the discharge criteria? <clears throat> yes, we will discuss together uh, this uh, criteria of governance and the priorities of this instrument and for sure the uh, climate priority will be seriously taken in account. Thank you. Now, um, Dragos Pislaru from Renew Europe. Thank you. Um, there seems to be a general consensus that structural reforms are critical for EU competitiveness, stability and resilience to shocks. However, even with the European semester process, the implementation of structural reforms has decelerated as the aftermath of the economic and financial crisis may be characterized rather by a blurred quest for stability and a reform fatigue, coupled with serious lack of leadership and commitment. This needs to be changed as being treating uh, as business as usual. Particularly, the implementation of reforms in non-EU countries um, deserve attention. Due to the strong interconnections um, between the economies of the EU, insufficient reforms outside the, EU, uh, the euro area cannot be seen anymore as a purely national problem. While structural reforms are designed to boost economic competitiveness, their benefits often materialize only over the long run, while their economic, social, and political costs are often incurred in the short term. For example, um, in the case of skill-enhancing reforms or education and training reforms or health-related or poverty alleviation interventions, reform implementation is characterized by short-term reform costs. The question is, will you share this perspective and commit as a champion of structural reforms to clearly backing such efforts of non-Euro member states to the adoption and the swift implementation of the reform support program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Pizlaru. Uh, we, we will have uh, the Commission and the Parliament a strong role in promoting structural reforms. We should have clear in our mind that this is a priority uh, because, yes, we can deal with the economic uh, slowdown with several means. Uh, we can have more um, open fiscal policies, uh, but structural reforms are uh, the only way in the midterm to have 
uh, economic growth and uh, prosperity. Uh, so in all sectors of our activity and of our rules, if the rules should be changed, the uh, priority will be given to structural reforms. Uh, we, we also know, being uh, elected members of the parliament, that frequently the uh, fatigue in structural reforms uh, is not mm, connected to uh, European rules, uh, but to national uh, elements, national reason, national factors. Instability, for example, is exactly for the reason you were mentioning, that you are deciding something with consequences not uh, after a few weeks and months, but after several years. And political instability is growing in our, count in our countries and member states. And this is weakening the tendency to address structural reforms. And this is a reason more to be committed as European institution and for myself uh, from this point of view. Follow up. You have mentioned the InvestEU program a couple of times, and, um, and thank you for, um, for highlighting that. Uh, we need to show a more simplified, flexible, and efficient use of the EU budget when we have this, all these budgetary constraints. The question is, will you commit to enhance the technical assistance component, especially to improve the geographical and territorial balance among the EU member states and ensure an equitable regional distribution and coverage of the in implemented funds, giving the difference in sophistication of the financial markets that we have at the European uh, Union level. Thank you. Yes, my answer is yes. We can't accept the idea that uh, such a relevant plan for us, Invest EU, supposed to raise something like 650 billion, uh, is limited to areas or single countries. So the commitment that I take is to have an equal distribution in all the union of this plan. Thank you. Last speaker, Enico Ghiori from EPP. Grazie, Presidente. Con suo permesso... Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll speak Hungarian. Now, Mr. Gentiloni, can you uh, reassure me that you're going to be credible in your role and you're actually going to act rather than just give us pretty words? The previous Commissioner threatened but didn't actually follow through on many occasions. I think, for example, it's unacceptable that uh, the Commission was more lenient on Italy rather than it was on Hungary. There was an issue on cohesion funds there. There were other member states that had problems when it came to budgetary discipline. But uh, in the Hungarian case, the Commission underestimated uh, Hungarian growth prospects, so I think that showed double standards. In spite of those double standards, Hungary introduced structural reforms and then produced growth. As Commissioner, then, would you uh, do away with these double standards? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Giori. Uh, I'll be uh, crystal clear on the fact that we will not have uh, double standards in implementing our rules. Um, this is a matter of trust, I, I understand. Uh, you, you can expect this uh, from uh, what I said this morning. Uh, you can look to my uh, biography, 
But apart from this, it is a matter of trust. This is my commitment. Uh, no double standard. This is also my uh, personal record in recent times in uh, the Italian uh, government. I was uh, always uh, defending, even in periods where this was not so easy in my country, always defending uh, European uh, rules, even if putting pressure of having within this rule a more pro-growth attitude. This has always been my position. Uh, so, no double standard towards any country and trust among us to work for the Union. Follow up. További aggodalmaim az unió összszintű versenyképességére vonatkoznak. Hogyha felvizezzük a szabályok... Well, the other concerns relate to the capacity for the European Union to be competitive. Because the problem is that if you change the rules in one way, then uh, you have other effects. I mean, if you damage investments, for example, you have problems. But there are countries who didn't manage alone to deal with unemployment problems. Other countries, however, did their homework and did manage to deal with that and did lower the unemployment rate. I think now we'll have to look at how we can intervene. If we can guarantee jobs, providing more favourable conditions to our businesses, well, that'll be a good thing. Whereas if we can't do it, then they'll leave the EU and they'll undermine our competitiveness. So what are you going to do so that the competitiveness of businesses is not damaged? We have many tools to do that. Uh, one, for example, will be the uh, what we call the, the carbon border tax uh, to avoid uh, comp competitive disadvantage for our companies. Uh, the other one is uh, the uh, uniform corporate tax um, and many others. I would not be so uh, pessimistic on uh, what we achieved uh, on uh, jobs uh, creation and unemployment in the last years. Because for sure the problem is still there in several countries, including my country, especially in some region of several countries. But if you look back to the year of the crisis, we had a progress. We, have, we should work on this progress and reach uh, even more result. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank members for their questions and the Commissioner designate Mr. Gentiloni for his answers. So now I invite uh, Mr. Gentiloni to make a brief uh, closing statement of five minutes before the conclusion of the meeting. Well, first of all, obviously, I would like to thank you very much for the three hours of discussion which we've had. It's been very intense. I'd like to thank all who have participated. Mr. Gentiloni also kindly thanks the interpreters. He's got to know them over the course of recent years and knows that the interpretation in the European Union is of a very high level and that it greatly facilitates work. So, thanks to the interpreters. I think that today is a fundamental step, a fundamental stage in democratic process in the European Union. If we need to question and possibly defend the democratic cause in Europe, then it is vital to have this sort of accountability. And I prepared for this hearing, thinking about your questions and preparing my thoughts, and I very much was conscious throughout this that this is a confirmation, an affirmation of the fact that European democracy may have its limits, but it is alive, 
it works and it is a valuable asset which will serve us well as we work together to develop the European Union still further into the future. And for that, I'd like to thank each and every one of you. Allow me now to return to one or two more specific points which I would like to emphasise for the sake of clarity. Simply because sometimes in responding to questions, one's time is limited and uh, it isn't easy to convey a complex response. But the fundamentals that I'd like to convey to you now are this. I will not accept situations of stalemate. I will always be committed to working for compromise and working for progress, to involving the Parliament in every way I can within the constraints of our rules. We cannot simply sit back and accept a stalemate situation. We cannot accept a situation where we fail to take a decision on some of the very many issues across we have which we have ranged across this morning. For example, tax. For example, our attitude to growth. For example, our budget rules, our budget policies, and the many other wide-ranging issues which indeed go above and beyond my specific potential portfolio. So I will never accept that we have reached an impasse and that we can't go further. It is absolutely vital that we focus on two things. One is on policy and the other is on cooperation. We've got to work to, together across different political beliefs. We've got to work across any potential divide between North and South, East and West. We need to overcome these. We need to work together with a focus on putting together shared policy commitments and delivering on these. And then the other thing we need is trust. We need reciprocal trust because without reciprocal trust and confidence, we will not be able to deliver on our common goals. We will fail. Trust is absolutely quintessential and this is why I say to you that I am here before you asking for you to place your trust in me. I am an Italian. I belong to the Socialist and Democrat family. But if I am confirmed as Commissioner for in the economy in the European Union. I shall be a commissioner for economics in the European Union and that is the role which I shall play and I shall defend to the hilt the cause of Europe. And it is for this reason that I am here before you to ask for your support. I'm sure that we will cooperate at best in our common European interest. Thank you very much for this morning and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gentiloni. I now close the meeting. A meeting of coordinators will now be held in camera to evaluate the hearing. Thanks. Presidenta.